record on my end if I can see how to do it. It looks like Lisa is recording already. There we go. Um, all right, welcome everyone to the Town of Silverton Master Plan Committee. Um, this evening we have a bunch of special guests who I'll introduce now, but then we're gonna review and approve minutes before we jump into the presentation. But we have Elizabeth Garner from DOLA, who I think is gonna be doing most of the presentation. And then we also have Nancy Gideon, who's, uh, and I probably said your last name incorrectly, but I think she's also gonna be participating in the presentation. They put a lot of work into um, these demography slides, and I think we'll all find them super helpful. So before we jump to that, um, why don't we do a quick roll call? So with respect to the committee, we've got uh, Lisa Adair, who I see. Can you say here just for the recording? Here. Thank you. Uh, Melissa Childs? Here. Jess Wiegert, I see, just popped in. Yeah. We're doing a roll call. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Sue Morris. Who I see. Um, Elizabeth Bars. Here. And myself. Um, and then I also see we've got administrator writer and a call in um, participant. So our first I am item here. is. <laughs> Hi, John. Um, our first item is to review and approve the minutes from the August 25th committee meeting. Did any of the committee members see any issues with those minutes they'd like to correct? All right, um, would someone make a motion to approve those minutes? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Sue. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Thank you, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all in favor? Just aye. Wonderful. All right. Motion passes. Um, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Elizabeth. Super, thank you. Um, again, my name is Elizabeth Garner and I'm with the State Demography Office and uh, we work a lot with um, the Community Development Office, which is working with the community on looking at your master plan update. And so what we like to do is sometimes set things out first and give you an update of um, kind of what are the conditions, what's going on in your community. That way, when you start going into the steps and the phases of uh, looking at your comprehensive plan update, that you have some baseline. Um, and as you go through it, um, if you've got questions, if you're like, oh, I wonder if she's got X, Y, Z, feel free to give us a shout uh, and we can see if that is something that we can help you with as well. Our goal is to obviously um, help you make your master plan updates as uh, beneficial as possible to you guys. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen and go through a slide deck. Now, obviously this is intended for you guys, so um, one of the weird things when you share your slide deck, I won't be able to then see you. Um, so you'll have to interrupt me, um, which is totally fun. That's what you're supposed to do if you've got a question, unless I do this really well and I can actually share the right spot. So let me see if I can do it. Now I bet you can't see it, can you? Let's so we see. can see it, but it's not full screen. It's not that big one like that I had before. Okay, so just one second. I'm gonna change it again real quick. Stop share and I'm gonna reshare. Because I shared the wrong side. All right, does that look better? Is that a full screen? That's it. All right. Um, great. So let me make sure I can see all of you guys.
All right. It's funny, I can't see you guys and look at the slides at the same time. So I'm gonna have to move you guys around a little bit. All right. So some of the biggest things to understand when we're work, moving forward, um, are there, there are some big trends that you probably wanna be watching that despite COVID are gonna be impacting the entire state. Um, now the biggest question would be how much of an influence is the state gonna have on San Juan and Silverton? Uh, and I think that's a fair question, but important to understand what we've been seeing as trends in the state. And so some of the big ones are, one is that the state is starting to grow at a slowing rate. So uh, not uh, fast paced growth, even though if you listen to media, They'll talk about like exponential growth, accelerated growth, all of these things, but that's not really what's going on. Um, there we go. Now they can actually see what I'm talking about. Um, second is concentrated growth. So we're seeing a lot of concentrated growth along the I-25 corridor. So, and even a, in a way, a consolidation. So a lot of people moving from the smallest counties so like the under 5,000 into the larger counties. So we're seeing this concentration of growth. Um, we're also having an issue related to migration a little bit within the state. And some of the biggest questions are, can we continue to attract and retain the best and the brightest? And if we do, where do we put them? Um, do we want to attract them? And it's definitely become a question within the front range. And I don't know how much on the Western Slope and in San Juan, specifically, but certainly a concern about migration and do we want additional people in the state? And that's not what I'm saying. That's what a lot of other people are saying. Um, aging certainly is something that's impacting the state significantly uh, and will so out into the future. And then we're also becoming more racially and ethnically diverse, which is another really uh, important fact to follow. And especially because it's our youngest population, and then we're seeing a little bit of downward pressure on income growth, primarily due to aging. So big picture, important to understand the context. And I'm gonna hit a lot of some US and Colorado. You might be thinking to yourself, all I care about is San Juan. Um, but it's important to understand the big picture to the, then see where San Juan fits into it. So the US is at about 328 million, increase at about um, 1.5 million people a year, or about a half of a percentage point. Interestingly, this last year, it was the slowest growth rate since 1918, which if you were listening the last several months, that's when we had the Spanish flu. So between 2018 and 2019, completely pre-COVID, we were, the U.S. was growing at a rate when we had the Spanish flu and World War I at the same time. So definitely some downward pressure and important to understand what those factors are because those aren't really changing. Uh, Colorado at the same time is about 5.7 million people, an increase um, of 1.2%, an annual average growth rate of 1.2%, so quick math, over twice as fast as the U.S. as a whole. Eighth fastest um, in terms of uh, rates among other states. Seventh in total growth, increasing by 67,000 people behind some really big states. Uh, and, it, and it's funny, it doesn't matter what I say, if I say 67, 85, 90, Everybody's like, oh, that's so many people. And I'm like, not really. Um, if you look at Texas, Texas increased by uh, 340,000. So that gives you a little bit of relative comparison. When we look along the growth, this is what I mean by concentrated. All the red, orange, yellow counties are counties that are increasing. All of the shades of blue are counties that are declining since 2010. So even though we're one of the faster growing states, we've got about 25% of our counties declining in population. And you can see the concentrated growth along um, the I-25, the Front Range Corridor. And it's important to start thinking about what's creating some of that um, strong growth. And you know, you've mm -hmm. got some different counties surrounding you, um, some counties declining. You've got then La Plata that's growing a little bit faster, and then you've got some slower growing counties with uh, your Wraith, San Miguel, and Montezuma. When we look at total growth, important to understand there's two components. 
There's burst minus deaths, which is the blue component. It's called natural increase, burst minus deaths. And we've got the red component, which is net migration that ends mass out. So it starts back in 1970. And so you can see growth over the, that entire time frame. In the 90s, we had really fast growth. So if somebody was going to say, oh, you had um, you know, accelerated growth in the 90s, I'd say, yeah, that's what we had. But it's certainly not what we've got right now. And if you can see 2019, we're at the slowest that we've been since 2005, even slower than during the Great Recession, which was in that 2009-10 timeframe. So important to see that really we are slowing down. And from both points, one, natural increase is slowing, so the burst minus deaths is slowing, as well as net migration, which is the ends minus out. Uh, if we look at both pieces, the burst and the deaths, uh, we can see that, I know, boring chart, two, two lines, um, increase in deaths, and that's not unusual. This is pre-COVID, and this is really just indicating that we've got a larger share of our age group um, in a larger share of our population in age groups with higher death rates. This is totally normal. This is what we should be seeing. But what is unusual is this slowdown in births. We've got about 7,000 fewer births per year now than we did in 2007 when we had our peak. So these are what this is the first two first point of takeaway is one, we have got increasing deaths and decreasing births, and that's putting downward pressure on total population. Likewise, that same piece is happening in the United States as a whole. Uh, we've got about 525,000 fewer births right now than we did in our peak in 2007. That makes our peak person born in the United States 13. And that's important for all of us to know, especially like if you're thinking about school districts, things like that, is that for the entire state, we've got a decline in that smaller age group. So if we look at Samwan and what we've seen since 2010, and we've got Silverton as well, as well as the unincorporated area, Region 9 as a whole, just simply because that's the part of the region that you're in, and then Uray simply because it's the kind of one of the neighbors that has influence in the area. Um, we are looking, you know, one of the hardest parts with a smaller county is getting good numbers. And so I would say you're hovering around zero. Uh, even though you've got a couple of years of out or declines, a couple of years of in, um, you may say there's starting a little bit of a trend starting back in 2016 where we've got three positive years. Um, for the county as a whole. Um, yeah, um, but it's hard to tell. Again, small area data is small area data. Um, but you can kind of see where that is. But it's maybe more interesting to look at is the growth rate. Um, so the percent change for the county as a whole is 2.4. For Silverton, it's a little bit slower, 2.2 meaning that I'm incorporated but with a great big number of three um, is 4.8%. Region nine, so this is a larger geography, probably more reliable information as a whole, increasing by 8.1%. Uh, and then your rate, increasing about 11%. So that kind of gives you a gauge of what's going on. What is interesting is that region nine is actually the fastest growing region on the West Slope. So definitely driving things a little bit more than other areas. Now, some of the other areas have been more negatively affected by um, mining, natural gas, uh, other gas extraction compared to Region 9, even though you've got some here, um, not as much of an influence maybe in total jobs that in other counties. Uh, if you like historical trends, thought we'd throw this in there for San Juan. Uh, peak back in 1910 uh, and where you guys are today. What's interesting, I think, to see is that um, basically since 1960, you know, what I would say uh, hovering around um, the same level. So even though we had some, you had some transitions in the 90s with the mining, I think you had both the, the uh, build up and draw down during the same decade so that there was 
a little influence for the total decade as a whole, but just something to, to show and something to see where population's been. If we look at region nine then and compare it to that same chart that you saw for um, the state as a whole, we can see the influence of both net migration, which in this slide is the red, as well as natural increase, which is the blue. Uh, they're just kind of they switched order in terms of top and bottom. So what we can see from this is really during the 90s, it was about a 50-50 split. But recently in Region 9, the natural increase has had a little bit more influence than the net migration. But on a couple of years, you've got some time in there where uh, it's about a 50-50. San Juan, um, this has been looking at that influence over time. And, um, you know, really what makes the biggest difference here in the San Juan is net migration uh, rather than natural increase. And which makes sense because you've kind of had a little bit of a boom and bust. And with such a small population base, it's really hard to build on that natural increase side. Um, but you can kind of see what that trend has been. If we look at the age distribution of your migrants, um, this is one of the things that I would call a, definitely a positive for the county is that on net, what tends to be a draw or that is that middle kind of 30. So it's like that 25 to 35 age group, which is a great age group to be able to attract. Um, it's, and it's not the same for every county. So every county is very different. Like if you were to see Summit County, it is really spikes at like the 20 year old because they attract a lot of young adults, especially seasonal kind of workers. And then they have like a net out from like the 35 on. Um, I think a lot of that is affordability. They can't afford to kind of buy a home, raise a family in Summit, for example. So I think that this does speak positive about some of the um, amenities that San Juan has. Uh, this one isn't going to be probably real helpful, but people always ask the question, so I thought I'd toss it in. So if we look at the net migration to San Juan in terms of where people are coming from, the kind of the orange and the yeah, the shades of orange are areas that are donors. Um, and then if you look at the blue, that's areas that are where you're losing people to. Again, remember, you've got very small numbers. So interesting, this relationship with Sawatch. Um, and I would be curious, do you know anyone from Sawatch? Because it's indicating that that's a donor county. Does anybody? No one. Yeah, see, so I think sometimes it's a plane with Dana, data, but Larimer County is in there. Um, and I'm not necessarily shocked to see that one simply because um, it's got a lot of younger adults and often because of CSU, they're kind of more outdoor rec oriented and that maybe that's a draw for Silverton um, and San Juan is that kind of natural resource outdoor rec lifestyle, maybe. I could be reaching, um, but I thought it was interesting to see, but it could just be a uh, bad day. So this is pre-COVID, um, and I just wanted to, again, kind of emphasize the point that there's a huge correlation between job growth and population growth. And we've been able to count on that for decades in terms of monitoring data and information for the state. When we have stronger job growth, which is the blue bar, we tend to get stronger net migration. And that makes sense. We need people to fill jobs. We haven't typically had enough people to fill all of the jobs that the state creates. Um, and sometimes we get even more people, even though we're not creating jobs. So like in that 2010 timeframe when we were having a recession, we were still attracting people simply because we were losing jobs in like uh, manufacturing and construction and gaining jobs in health services and uh, education services. So they did, there was a, a mismatch. Also shows a couple of things, even pre-COVID, what we were forecasting in terms of the future is 
you know, some faster growth up front, but then slower growth out into the future. Um, both the slowdown in job growth as well as a slowdown in net migration, simply because in the U.S. as a whole, we're also seeing those same factors, a slowdown in job growth and a slowdown in net migration. And interestingly, for the U.S. as a whole, one of the biggest factors is lack of labor force. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that because COVID puts a smidge of a wrench in that. Um, we had been at our historically lowest level of unemployment, and then we go to our highest level of unemployment within four months. Um, so it definitely kind of changes the scenario and changes how we talk about things. Again, just a quick map um, showing uh, pre-recession peak level, so pre-first recession peak level, so the ninth, you know, the 2005-9 recession. Um, pre-recession peak levels compared to now and all of the red, orange, yellow counties are the counties that are back to pre-recession peak levels of employment. All of the shades of blue are below. So San Juan, just a smidge below pre-recession peak levels of employment, which I'll get into in a second. But what we can see is that this also looks very similar to the map of the state showing population growth. Again, drawing this relationship between job growth and population growth. So what are the base industries in San Juan? Um, obviously, so when I say base industry, what is your economic driver? What is bringing in outside dollars that can be spent locally? Obviously, tourism is huge. Uh, it's about 56% of your economy, followed by retirees. And then what we have are regional services, commuters, dividends, interest, rent, transfer payments, federal state government, and then very little manufacturing, ag, and mining currently. Um, important to see what these are, because these, again, bring in the outside dollars. Um, definitely very strong on that tourism side, which I don't think is very surprising to anybody. A retiree, somebody might be like, what the heck is a retiree, and why is that an economic driver? Well, uh, retirees come up to a location or just age in place. They've got savings or retirement income, and they spend it locally. And so that can be an important driver. And when we look at your age distribution, you'll see that you do have um, older adults in San Juan. And so they're spending their dollars locally. Regional services, uh, most of those are gonna be falling under the construction side uh, that you've got locally. Commuters are a funny one. Um, these are folks that live in San Juan, but bring their dollars in from outside. So they hold jobs potentially in Uray or in uh, La Plata, or they could be a uh, location neutral person to where uh, they may live in San Juan, but their dollars come from Chicago or something. Like that. Dividends, interest, rent. This is, this, these are called trustafarians. Uh, so the independently wealthy, uh, younger than a retiree. Uh, so you've got a little bit of those there. Uh, transfer payments are the opposite end. Uh, those are folks that are living on the edge that are needing um, transfer payments, whether from the feds or from the state to survive. And so those are the dollars coming in. Federal and state government or federal and state government jobs. Um, and then you can see very little manufacturing or anything else. Um, any, I guess I should stop and say, are there any questions yet? You guys are good? Okay. Um, so if we then translate then those into jobs, so the base industries into uh, employment by industry, this is showing your 2019 employment by industry. So obviously um, accommodations food service is topping out that list. So hotels um, and restaurants are on that top part and second is uh, local government, retail trade, arts, entertainment, recreation, that can be the um, ski area, falls under that category, professional services, admin and waste, um, so these can be janitorial services or administrative services, construction, real estate, and you can see the different ones there. It's color-coded by wage rate, so a purple is a mid-wage, a red is a high wage, a low wage, and a green is a high-wage job. 
that kind of gives you an idea of the balance. So about 20% low wage, about 70% uh, mid wage, and about 9% high wage. And oddly enough, this isn't a bad mix. Um, seeing the largest share in that mid wage isn't a bad thing at all. Um, it was interesting, we were doing comparisons by counties and you've got one of the strongest mid-wage uh, shares of all counties. So it's, it's actually not a bad place. The reason why is that when you start building that high wage side, that tends to start, um, a lot of local governments and a lot of especially economic developers think that that high wage should be that goal. But the problem with that is that when they start you start building a lot of that, that pushes prices up, prices of housing, prices of other goods and services. Also their demands change. So their demands for um, coffee, uh, like uh, eating out, they put a lot of pressure on low wage areas. So then they create a lot more in that accommodations, food service, um, retail trade areas than a mid wage does because they tend to have more disposable income. So just something to be thinking about that um, you've also got a nice distribution of wage jobs by wage. And about 460 jobs. Now, does that sound about right to you guys? Does that feel yes, no? I'm curious if, if the other 200 are all, they must be either below working age or retired? Is that kind of the assumption that we make between the difference of 460 and the total residents? Yes, but I'll talk a little bit about, um, you've also got commuters, people that come in uh, from out of county to fill some of these positions as well. So it's not gonna be a perfect match. I wanted to show a little bit in terms of where you've seen some growth since 2008, which is in that far right side. Um, just to show like what has been growing um, since the recession and then the 2019 shows that current level. So you can see where those strengths are. A little bit of um, a slowdown definitely on the construction side. Um, you know, you can see where your growth has been kind of balanced between local government, arts, science, entertainment, recreation, and admin and waste services, um, within real estate and wholesale trade coming in a little bit after that. So you can see across the board. And then, you know, where you do, do see um, manufacturing down, mining down, other services down, private education down. Then, like I said, construction is the biggest decline. So a gain of up 35 jobs since 2008. I also then separated all of that same data by way, whether it's a wage and salary job. So that means that like you work for someone or if you're a sole proprietor, uh, like you own your own business and you don't have employees. Uh, this helps because it might give you an idea of areas that you could expand or areas that you need to worry about, um, at least be aware of. Uh, it's not surprising at all to see in construction the large share of proprietors. You can probably even think about the folks in your community that um, have, you know, it could be, uh, you know, they do construction just basically out of the back of their truck, you know, their um, doing remodels or other pieces that you can imagine. Um, the other one that you can also, interesting, the retail trade, that's a little unusual to see retail trade, but these could be people uh, just with a shop themselves and they run it themselves or they might be doing something online. Uh, professional and technical services, so that's kind of sweet um, to see. I, I guess I should hit real estate first, that's normal, that's what they typically are. Um, but professional technical services, so that's kind of cool and that's something to be um, looking at into the future. These are folks that work for themselves, they could be an accountant, they could be an attorney, um, they could be uh, an architect, and they are doing this on their own and they live in San Juan. 
Uh, so this is, and professional technical services tend to be um, a, not a not recession proof, but they're a little bit more balanced right now. Uh, they tend to also be a little bit higher wage, so that's kind of kind of cool to see. Um, admin and waste. Not unusual to see a lot of our janitorial services have turned into uh, proprietors as well. But you can see down that list um, where the different ones were, but I definitely wanted to highlight the professional technical services on there. Uh, the other one that's interesting is, well, it's very small. Um, wholesale trade might be something that can also be done virtually. So it's one that's kind of a low, can be a location neutral job, I mean, that, that's a job where you're basically setting people up. It's like, you know where goods are and you know where people that need the goods are. And so you bring them together. And so that hotel wholesale trade concept could be also done virtually as well. Any questions on any of these jobs by industry area? So do you take into account seasonality, you know, seasonal work? Right. So these uh, get converted into a full-time equivalent. So you may not see, for example, under the arts, entertainment, recreation, which um, is going to be primarily the, res the uh, um, ski area, you may not have, for example, 41 full-time year-round employees there. Uh, but they'll take the total employees and convert them into a full-time equivalent. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so commuting. Um, again, sometimes you have to be a little careful with the commuting data. It, it sometimes isn't perfect, but it's an interesting way to look at everything in the county. The dark green circle are the jobs in the county. The light green circle are your workers in the county. And so you can see that they don't completely overlap. Um, you can see that they're in the dark green that is not overlapped right now. Um, those are jobs filled by people outside of the county. Then the middle piece of the Venn diagram is where they live and work together. Um, the light green are folks that live in the county yet work outside. This kind of gives you those numbers down below it. Again, um, and you'll notice that these jobs, job numbers are different than the 460 I just talked about because this is only looking at the wage and salary. This doesn't include all of the uh, proprietor jobs. And this is 2017 data, not 2019, because that's the most current, unfortunately, that they've got available. So the top graph, the, the top list of places up here on the, on the right-hand side for those that live, that work in San Juan, this is where they come from. So most of them are coming in from Silverton, which makes sense. Uh, but then we've got Durango, Colorado Springs, Grand Junction, Denver, and you might be looking at this and you're like, yeah, no, they are not commuting from Highlands Ranch on a daily basis to work in um, San Juan. And that's because sometimes there's issues with um, the reporting and or there that job in San Juan may be filled by somebody out or it gets to that seasonality that you were talking about Sue they could actually their home residence might be in uh, Flagstaff but they work during the winter in San Juan but they pay taxes and stuff like that out of Flagstaff mm -hmm. so that's why um, it's not always a true commute. Like you can imagine probably with Durango that it is, but you know, other than that, you know, maybe Ridgeway would also be a potential commute, um, but you know the drive. <laughs> um, most of that is probably not always done on a week, on a daily basis. And then the folks that live in San Juan that might work elsewhere. Um, again, we've got number one and two, Silverton, Durango makes sense grand junction i don't know what is the drive time between um silverton and, and grand junction that can't be fun that's got to be several hours yeah about three hours yeah so people aren't going to be doing that probably on a daily basis but again it might be the case 
to where that that's where their employer is located. But anyway, interesting to kind of see the relationship and that it's not a one-to-one -one people living and working necessarily in San Juan. So let's talk about uh, location neutral jobs just a smidge because I know that that might be an interest in the county. Um, so right now that your, your main economic driver is tourism and it's got a lot of benefits. Uh, it's got a benefit for the tax base. Certainly it creates employment opportunities. The one of the pieces that's really interesting is that it also creates extra spending. So you can probably have some restaurants and breweries that um, you may not normally be able to support just within your own community if it weren't for tourism supporting it as well. So there's definitely benefits from tourists. Um, also attracting uh, investment, businesses. And then I highlighted this idea of prospective residents. I will tell you that tourism is the best marketing tool out there for your community. And it's something that your neighbors have done uh, historically. So for example, uh, Montrose, it's one of its biggest marketing issues or de uh, benefits is Telluride. They've got the airport, people fly into Montrose, they go and they visit Telluride and then they come back and they're like, huh, I kind of like it here. I could locate in this area. And so it's, it's basically, it's free marketing for your area. So think about that with your tourists as well. If you're interested in attracting more people to Silverton is think about your tourists as one of those resources or one of those sources. Now, what are some negatives of tourists? Um, well, they definitely can push up prices of goods and services. Um, definitely an economic um, volatility. Uh, and we've seen that several times. Also an interesting impact in terms of outside ownership in management of areas. So even like some of the second homes that you've got or VRBOs, um, they may be owned by people that aren't from the community and that may have a negative impact, um, maybe not. Also um, definitely pushes up prices of the, of the cost of infrastructure development. You end up having, um, you know, instead of having 700 plus folks on a regular day, you could easily probably put have 2100. I mean, you could probably maybe easily triple that population depending on the day of, um, and you have to provide infrastructure for that. Um, I don't know, what is your peak? Do you know what your peak tourist day is in the county by chance? Anybody? I'm just curious more than anything. Historically, it probably was around July 4th weekend. This year, Labor Day rivaled it. And is it about triple the resident population? Uh, probably significantly more than that. Oh, good. So even higher. So, Elizabeth, do you think it's what, quadruple five? I mean, I'm curious, five, six times the... I know that in um, some 4th of July uh, holidays, we had 12,000 or more visitors. Oh my heavens. That's usually when 4th of July is on a weekend, but that's once a year, you know, and uh, the train can bring, what, 2,000 people, I believe, in a day. So we, um, yeah, we, the tourism brings generally more people than what we have in town. Yeah, so I mean, if you can get up, upwards of that. So huge impact, obviously, on infrastructure because you have to make sure that you've got water, roads, uh, probably um, emergency services to handle those peak numbers. Um, and they're not your residents. But I mean, obviously- Can anyone can. hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, this is uh, Trustee Barella. I've been on the phone listening because uh, I'm working. And it is the 4th of July week. Um, we've never really been able to gauge how far our outreach was and how many people um, approximately come during those time frames. And uh, Lisa Dare was exactly right, depending on whether or not it falls on a weekend. This would have been on a Saturday and we had 36,000 potential reaches that were trying to come to Silverton for this year 
but due to COVID obviously it didn't happen. So that gives you a scope of how many more that's, uh, you know, a, a, so it's such a multitude of people um, that it, it's not even fathomable how we do this. <laughs> um, and it's not the porta potties and the infrastructure that has to be put in in order to handle this um, for that week is tremendous. The town spends about fifteen thousand dollars just on porta potties around the town, and every nook and cranny in space is filled up for that entire uh, seven days around there. Um, more so, obviously, when it's on the weekend. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that info. That's great to hear. Um, so obviously supports the point that you have this infrastructure demand on your community. So that's what makes kind of the location neutral person interesting. Um, because one, it's kind of in a tourism dependent community, it can be pretty expensive to start a new business. Um, in terms of like land can be a little bit higher in value, et cetera. Plus you tend to have a lot of low wage jobs and then there's a constraint in terms of housing. Um, so a location neutral person um, is not a bad gig in terms of folks going after that target audience. And a lot of places are looking at it. And that, you know, the question has to be, you know, is it right for us? Um, do we have the right fit for it? Um, because as everything, there are benefits and drawbacks. There's not just only benefits. Um, Certainly an impact on housing because demand for housing goes up. Um, can be an important increased tax base in terms of property taxes because then that price has gone up. Um, sometimes can be a variable impact to sales tax. So for example, and we'll get into this uh, on the next slide, in looking at your housing, even if you were able to convert some of your second homes to primary residence, um, there's actually some research out there that sh looks at the impact of a tourist versus the impact of a resident. And a tourist actually spends more money than a resident does because they're on vacation where a person that is a resident uh, isn't. <laughs> um, they end up having to cook more from home, et cetera. So that variable impact to sales tax, there's a benefit and a drawback. Uh, and again, more need for services. Uh, because there tend to be more year round. So these are some of the big questions to ask in terms of looking at seasonal or looking at uh, the location neutral. You know, do we, do we want to market to them? Uh, what kind of folks do we typically attract? Um, what do they really want from a community? And then maybe most importantly with this comp plan look that you guys are working on is, does our planning process and planning framework support this or are there some seeking points that would be difficult um, and then of course how would a location neutral person impact other factors in our community so just some questions to start thinking about and asking yourself as you guys move forward in this area so i wanted to talk about housing because i thought it would be really fun to look and do a little bit of verification so we'll see with lisa how close we are in terms of estimates to what we have versus what you guys are showing um, so again, total population, you've seen these numbers before. Um, all of them are, are people, all of them are households. Nobody's living in a group quarter, which tends to be like a jail or a university or a nursing home. Um, your average kind of the persons per household will maybe just use two as a general. It's a little bit lower in Silverton as a whole, a little bit higher in San Juan, but kind of driven by that unincorporated area. Total housing units around um, 793 uh, for the county as a whole, 522, uh, and this is using 2019 data. Uh, we, your, um, now I'm going to forget his name and it's on my other slide that I can't see. Um, gentleman on your staff that's been very good about supplying housing data. Um, so give him a kudos uh, and maybe I'll Try it. No, I can't do that. If I push that button, I'm losing everything. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, less than half are owner occupied, not even owner occupied, occupied. Um, only about 353, 358, leaving about um, 
435 vacant with a vacancy rate of about 54%. And of those vacant units, about 79, 80% of them are seasonal vacant. So this is actually very common, very typical. Um, if we looked at um, Summit County, they're even higher. It's, they're a little over 65%. So you're not the worst uh, in terms of that balance of share. Uh, this is really pretty normal for a what we call like resort beautiful county. So you've, you've got both the ski area and it's beautiful, so we, you get both title. Um, but it does make things interesting because uh, there's a lot of housing that's not being used on a normal basis. So does, Lisa, does this look right at all? Maybe. Which Lisa? Me? I think so. You're you're the um, one, right? You would know, right? It it does make sense, and it it. But I only have anecdotal information, so this is a really interesting chart to me. Okay, good. Um, also, this is something that we can maybe even help you work with um, down the road. Fortunately, what we've got going on right now is Census 2020, and we'll get a new updated count of total housing units occupied and vacant coming up. Um, if it's done well and if we can get some good data uh, with COVID going on. So that'll be nice and we should get that probably by mid-summer next year. I mean, I know that's a little late, but we'll, at least that's possible. Likewise, there might be some opportunities to play with the assessor data and actually, you know, do some work with just with administrative records. You. Another another item that affects our housing, since the numbers are fairly low, I mean, our total housing units is pretty low, is the number of vacation rentals, which um, in town is 40-some, 40 43, 44, I think we're up to, 43 vacation rentals. And then there's, there's, um, there's not a lot in the county till you get down to Cascade Village. But um, there's also some in the county. So we have quite a bit of vacation rentals and that affects what's available for workers. Yep, absolutely. So that, you know, one of the biggest constraints on housing um, tends to be from this. And so, you know, then if it's, you know, if you're looking at expanding, uh, whether with the newer ski area or with um, location neutral folks, it's the question is where will they live and what kind of housing will be available and how do you manage that? This gives a little bit more breakdown in terms of the types of units, uh, in terms of if they're you know, single buildings or if they're multifamily, um, what the average year of construction is. Uh, it's, it's funny. 1956 for your your rental units I thought was an interesting uh, median year of construction um, but that gives you a little bit of general idea in, in in terms of the price of for the owner median value for the owner occupied uh, and gross rent and where it compares to Colorado average again just some data pieces that you can see and, and know that are available um, again they may not be completely accurate so this is stuff that we can work on with you so now, if, any questions on housing or anything like that? Because I'm gonna quickly switch over to just talk about age real quick and then our forecast. Okay. So age is really important because uh, people change by age. This is Colorado's age distribution. And um, we can see kind of our peak person is 29 and Broken down by generation, black lines at 65. You can see the slowdown in that young adult population or the youngins uh, population for sure. When we're looking at growth by age group, you know, because of this distribution, we can see a lot of people aging into the 65 plus. Therefore, for Colorado as a whole, one of our in, one of the interesting things that we're dealing with is that we've got the fastest growth is in our oldest population. So really in that uh, 75 to 84, over 50% increase that we're forecasting. And this is just in the short time frame between 2018 and 2025 when the whole state is forecast to increase by about 
uh, very slow with that young end. So important to see that. Uh, we're aging really fast simply because we're also really, really young. Uh, we're one of the six youngest states, but we've got the second fastest aging population. Huge increase in that 65 plus makes a big impact on our economy uh, is the biggest piece. Also big impact on the labor force, housing, income, transportation, disabilities, all of that is huge. So let's look at San Juan. If we look at San Juan's age distribution, you can kind of see the impact of being able to attract young adults uh, because we see you know, some of your stronger uh, population is kind of in that mid to late 30s, but you've also got a little bit of a peak down at the older end as well, uh, which again is interesting to see and know that if these folks are currently in San Juan, they plan on aging in place. And so it's one of the big questions would also be to make sure that everybody's got the resources that they need to be able to age in place. If we compare your age distribution to other counties or to the state as a whole, uh, you can see that a little bit older, um, a little bit higher share in that older population, but then pretty similar and just not a lot of the 20 to 29 year olds necessarily compared to the state average. What is our forecast for you guys? Um, definitely a lot of growth in that oldest aged population. Again, I think it'll be nice to see the data from census 2020 when it comes out. But this would be my biggest thing to, to check on is just to make sure that these folks got, have the resources they need to age in place. Um, but again, what we're seeing very slow growth at the younger ends um, and then a decline in those 55 to 64 year olds and 65 to 74 simply because there's a little bit of a gap in the population in those age groups. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time either talking on population by race, but I do want to focus on two things. One, when we look at our entire population for the state of Colorado, our diversity lies in our younger population, basically in our population under the age of 20. And that's what this graph shows. This is showing our people of color in the state. And we can see right now in 2015, we've got a much stronger population in our younger ages, a, a higher share, and very little uh, in our older ages. Forecast to increase by all age groups, but the reason why I bring this up is that our youngest population is a lot more diverse. And if you're looking at attracting a lot more younger people, just remember that they'll also probably be also more diverse. So in terms of marketing, outreach, connections, all of those things, important to remember that diversity component. This is just talking that about a large share of our entrance to the labor force are going to be Hispanic. So that's important to take a look at. Um, in across the board, whether it's in the um, uh, tourism based industries or anything else that you might be looking at. Uh, but we know that San Juan is not super diverse um, compared to the state as a whole uh, or the region. Um, so about 90% white non-Hispanic compared to the state, which is at about 68% compared to the region, which is about 77%. Uh, largest share that's coming in is maybe is on that Hispanic side. So just to show where you guys are. So what is our forecast and what do we kind of build it off of? It really is an understanding of the two pieces, the total population that currently lives there, as well as the jobs that are forecast. So we do the job forecast for San Juan, and we base it on what are the industries in San Juan and how they're forecast to grow in the state, as well as in the nation. Then we look at your current population, we age you through time, apply birth rates and death rates. And that then ends up being our supply of workers, our, the population side, and our demand for workers is the job side. And then that demand for um, workers or migrants comes from where there's a mismatch. But then we've got COVID and we know where the industries are that have been hit. Definitely a huge hit in terms of accommodations, food service. The blue bars show the loss in the state between January and April. So a loss of about 342,000 jobs. The orange shows the growth from April through July, gained back a lot of those jobs. So you can see again where those are, but additionally where we've lost some more. For example, in uh, state government is in that grouping. Uh, we just got our furlough notices today. Um, what is our forecast for the state? Um, 
So 2020 is a tough year. Uh, we think that we're going to be down by the end of the year about 150,000 jobs, about uh, anywhere between kind of about 5% decline in terms of jobs, maybe 6%. A uh, little bit of growth next year in terms of jobs, but probably not getting back to pre-recession peak levels of employment for the state as a whole, probably until about 2023 into 2024. So definitely very slow and slow in those industries where we've lost jobs. We're not sure that we're gonna gain all of them back. If we look again where San Juan is, um, and remember this is pre-COVID or pre-COVID forecast. Um, so dark orange is where we had your jobs. So um, about 440 jobs in 2020 and just kind of bouncing around we get into the 450s and then 460 by the end so about a plus 20 jobs and again this is based on historical trends and where you fit um, today this does not take into account transitions or changes so like if you put in the new um, ski area it does not take that into account at all and it probably takes into very little account the change in terms of broadband is since that's been a little bit more of a recent change, we haven't been able to take it into account in terms of total um, time trends. If we look then at the population side, basically remaining fairly flat as well, 765 up a little bit, and then remaining fairly flat. Um, I highlighted some of the areas that were the bigger drivers in terms of those changes. But this is again the forecast that we had. So the point you should take away is fairly flat. A little bit of a gain on the job side, um, fairly flat on the population side. Again, with no, this is looking at historical trends. I pulled in some of the, those same kinds of concepts for both Region 9 as well as your Again, um, growth. Uh, in, in Region 9 for jobs and population a little bit, um, it, it ends up being about average for the West Slope. Um, you can, driven by traditional basic national, uh, regional national services and retirees, so there isn't a huge tourism component in this. Your race, same idea, wealth, residents, and uh, traditional, driving what's going on in that county as well. So again, just to kind of see where things are uh, balanced. So we know with COVID that there are gonna be impacts to bursts. We're seeing a slowdown, continued slowdown in bursts right now. Uh, higher deaths simply because uh, more people that are older are being affected by it and we can't have this higher death rate. So we know that we're gonna have downward pressure on population growth in the state. We don't know what's happening in terms of migration. Anecdotally, we've been trying to look at different pieces. We know that we are getting some more ins from like California, New York, Florida. They've had, they've been hit harder by COVID and so we've gotten more of them here. Colorado is less costly than those states as well, makes it a little bit easier. We also have heard of people leaving the state, returning to their families, wherever they may be, either to be with families or because they've lost their jobs here. Um, so we know that there's this balance going on. We've been playing with some um, truck or some moving van data as well as housing sales data, which would indicate that there's probably a net in going on rather than a net out uh, going on, simply because we've got so few housing, uh, houses on the market and anything that gets on the market is quickly sold. Um, we know that a lot of people are moving to mountain communities like yours and teleworking, at least for a couple of months, uh, why they can. Um, but we know that across the state that there are issues with broadband, housing, daycare, uh, health care. Uh, and we know that Colorado's had higher costs in terms of housing. So our forecast out into the future really shows this slowdown in the, in the short run and then building back up. And then this drive in the, in the um, population growth is really driven by retirements out into this kind of 20, 25 to 2030 time frame. Folks like me leaving the labor force, um, I will be staying in the state, but somebody else is gonna need my job. And so that's driving about 40, anywhere between 40 and 45,000 retirements a year. Uh, so we're gonna be needing people to fill those positions if they're filled. 
but across the state, what our forecast is um, increasing about 2.4 million. Uh, we're going to be lowering that forecast a little bit. It is going to be closer to about 2.2 million out by 2050, but it's going to remain the same about majority of the growth along the front range. The grayed out counties are counties where we have flat to no growth. Um, and that's kind of the story. Um, so hopefully the biggest takeaways that you take from this is one, everything is connected. So when you're doing this comp plan, it totally makes sense that you're looking at all of these separate pieces, population, housing, jobs, labor force, important. And then all of the community services that go with that. Know that big picture things are slowing down. International migration is down, births are down, deaths are up. So we are feeling this slower pressure, not only in Colorado, but in the US as a whole. But I think it all is in a place like uh, San Juan, it's, a, it's up for grabs. Even if Colorado's slowing, that doesn't necessarily mean that San Juan will slow um, because it's a unique location. But just be aware of it. Be aware that we've got these slowing forces, but you've got a great opportunity in attracting tourists um, that you then might get those couple of folks that say, hey, this is a sweet location. I wanna be here too. Aging, obviously a huge impact to the state and will be impacting San Juan. A race as well in terms of looking at that future and the future of Colorado, future of our labor force, future of our migrants. Uh, definitely in Southwest Colorado, I mean, some of the benefits are is that it is one of the stronger uh, regions in the front, in the uh, Western Slope. A little bit more diverse in terms of its economy than the rest of the Western Slope. Um, and you've got a little bit more connection to some other states in terms of um, you're not solely necessarily dependent on Colorado. I don't think there's, obviously there's a lot of risks and you probably, yet since you've been working with the Community uh, Development Office, they've probably talked about resiliency and you've gone through those uh, workshops and information with them. So you understand some of the risks that are going on and I was happy to hear from the mayor that uh, it was a, a successful summer despite COVID that you had a lot of visitors coming up, which is great to hear, and, and especially when you didn't have the train service. Um, but just be aware of some of these risks that are out there in your plans going out into the future and maybe set some short-term um, milestones that you wanna hit or look at. You know, what happens a year from now? What happens five years from now? Type and run different scenarios. So any questions or anything like that from you guys? Comments, doubts. Oh, uh, thank you. That that was a huge amount of information. Um, it was very helpful. Um, but yeah, if you want to go back to speaker view, we can open it up for discussion, questions, and comment. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Was everyone digesting, or any uh, anyone at the edge of their seat ready to dive in and ask a handful of questions? Well, I think the biggest takeaway um, was the focus on retirement age folks. I guess we weren't, I wasn't expecting that. Um, I mean, here I am, but uh, no, this is enlightening. And you're right about resources to age in place. So. You know, the aging has been discussed recently by the, um, the county public health nurse uh, over the past year. I've heard Becky Joyce talking to the commissioners about how our population here seems to be aging. And also, I have two little kids, so I find it interesting when I'm over dropping off my kids at the elementary school, I see the highest diversity in town. And I wonder even if some of those families are counted where I think some of the elementary classes might be one quarter or one third um, Spanish speakers or bilingual young children, which is interesting. And it, there's no telling if they'll um, 
you know, uh, grow roots here or stay here. Um, but for, fu for the future, we might have an aging population and perhaps more Spanish speakers. Yeah, Lisa, I was thinking the same thing about that, that it was like 9% Latino, because at school for the last probably 15 years, the population at school has been about 30 to 33% um, Sp Spanish speaking students. And I know that that doesn't necessarily translate to the rest of town um, being the same demographic, but I think it is, I would guess it's higher than 9% total. And yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, I mean, some of those elementary classes you go in to and perhaps half of the children speak, speak Spanish or they're bilingual. So that sort of matches the demographics that in the future Silverton might end up, um, especially with younger diversity. I'm really curious to know, um, you know, as we're looking at projections into the future, and our population essentially like if we do nothing different is what i'm hearing that we kind of remain in this stasis with our population and i'm really curious to know if your office has any data from other communities that have made similar efforts um, to what we're doing in silverton to really try to bolster their economies and how that has looked over time um, obviously you know you're looking for patterns over time and some of the initiatives that are being pursued here in silverton are too new for us to really know and and i'd be really curious to see if there are comparisons that we can draw elsewhere in the state that might help us wrap our heads around um, what the future of silverton might look like if we keep pushing in the direction that we are you know that's a really good question um, you know, and it's one that you may want to take up with, uh, do you guys do a lot of, of work at all with Region 9 at all uh, with Laura Lewis? Um, see if she's aware of any other group, any other community in this yeah. Southwest region. Um, I know that Chafee County over the last, at least probably 10 years, maybe, maybe a little bit less, maybe eight, they have been really working hard on that area. Um, of diversifying their community, attracting more businesses to their community, and attracting more people. And you're starting to really see it play out now. Now, I know Chafee is not the same as San Juan. It's a little bit easier to get to. It's on two major um, transportation corridors, and it's, uh, but it still attracts a lot of the outdoor rec and out outdoorsmen. So, um, that you may want to talk with some of the folks from Chafee and what they've done. I know that their economic developer, um, Wendell Pryor, has been a huge advocate and um, bringing in new young firms uh, and young folks so that he might be a good resource as well, even though it's not completely comparable. Great, thank you. And we do work very closely with Region 9, so I'll ask the same question of Laura. Yeah, and she, I know she works with a lot of then the other economic developers across the state, so then they may have some ideas of some other places that have been, that are more similar to you, um, that have been trying to do these kind of outreach um, activities. But certainly, you know, and I was telling the mayor this the other day, I mean, getting access to broadband was huge. I mean, that was an important, like almost essential first step. So I'm curious how, or if you've seen this data used by other communities in crafting decision framework and how they've done that successfully. So um, that, that is a good question. I have typically not been part of the next phase. And that's something where Casey and Andy um, may be more able to talk about how they've done that and how they do it. I know that we do this piece a lot. I would say with 
probably five to 10 communities a year where it's really going through their current conditions and, and explaining where they currently are and some ideas about what could be happening. Um, so it's a great point that I probably need to be better at understanding what that framework looks like so that I can help with that next step. So I'll work on that. <laughs> it's a good note. Um, and, I'll and I'll chat with Andy and Casey as well to see if there's something that we can do relatively quickly to help San Juan Silverton in this process. Thank you. I have another question that's a little bit of intrigue on my part. When you opened up the session, you were talking about um, taking note of migration patterns. And the question was, do we want to have um, these types of, do we want this migration to continue or not? And my question was going to be, do we want to continue attracting this migration? cohort, what would you do if you did not want to? So, you know, this is, the, I think this is the important question for Colorado. Um, so definitely in the front range, um, some communities have been anti-growth and they have put things in place that they think is going to help stop growth, mm -hmm. uh, like constraints on housing um, in terms of moratorium either on housing development. But in a metro area like Denver, you know, if one place puts a, you know, a moratorium, then people just move the next step out. And so then you're driving through that community. Um, so it's not like you, you get a win off of that. Um, what I hope people take away from this is that Typically, migration is a result of job growth. So if you don't want migration, then I would be very, and this is not you, but I'm saying the, the universal you, um, then be careful with the jobs that you're growing. Because typically when you grow jobs, that means additional people. And for some folks, that's a really, that they don't see that. They'll, they are like, yeah, no, Elizabeth, I am totally done with people. I don't want any more people, but I do love jobs. Give me some jobs. And I'm like, how can you say that? <laughs> um, you've got to have the two of them together. And then it's coming up with a good balance. And people have asked, you know, like, is there a good balance between uh, job growth and population growth? And I, you know, and I can't say that a 1%, a 2%, a 3% is the right What's right is what's right for you guys, for what's right for Silverton or for rights for San Juan. If you can accommodate 100 people, great. That means you, but you need to think about it. What kind of housing, what kind of jobs? And then if they come with kiddos, is there enough room in school? Um, if you can only if you make it with five, then what does that take? So this is an, it, it becomes a math problem in terms of what, what works and how do I make it work well for everyone so that it doesn't hurt. Um, there was somebody saying that you could fit everyone from the state of Colorado in the county of Weld County, where Greeley is, and they wouldn't, it would be half the density of New York City. Now, granted, nobody wants to live necessarily at half the density of New York City, but um, some of Colorado's issues have been on the whole this planning effort and how do we plan well? And how do we make sure that we keep up on the roads and bridges? How do we make sure that we've got the services like healthcare and daycare? Um, that we just don't create the jobs, which is economic developers do a great job with that, but then they don't always bring along the rest of the county or community and re realize what that means. So again, if this new uh, ski area that you're looking at, 
understand what the implications are and what that's going to mean and you know go go in with it with your eyes open if it's something that you guys choose if you go after location neutral understand what those implications are and open eyes thank you this is a question more for people on on the call is just a piece of data that jumped out at me but i saw that from 1950 to 1960, we saw a population drop from 1470 to 1849, or sorry, from 1470 to 849. It's like a, I don't know, 40 something percent population drop. Anybody know what happened from 1950 to 1960 that caused that decline? I, I saw something on that graph, Shane, and I was wondering if it was because San Juan County used to be shaped different than it than it is now and it it used to have a lot more you know when when the population here was supposedly over a thousand that i think one of the slides said it was 1908 or 1902 1910 yeah it was and and the county i think had a lot more land then um but i'm i'd have to look that up um but then in the 50s was when the mines shut down for a while. There was no mm -hmm. money here in the 50s, which is why our buildings still look old because they were not updated in the 50s. You know, and I can do a quick check. We've got, uh, I might not get it today, but um, we've got a map series that show the shapes of the counties over time. And so I can, send that to you guys because that could be the case is that you guys got carved up. Yeah, because then it's been pretty consistent since 1960. I'm wondering if it was post-World War II migration with suburb development, better jobs closer to cities and people came back from the war and picked up. That's a good one. <clears throat> That's an interesting one too. In the 50s there was a there was migration from Silverton when the mines closed and a lot of those families ended up in the downtown core of Durango, uh, not far from the train station, um, especially Hispanic families and Italian. Um, and that was in the 50s and 60s. So that might be part of it. We'll follow up. We'll, we'll send you what we can find. <laughs> That's a good question. Because like, it's funny, like Lake County was very similar. They, um, you know, but theirs was really related to mining. And so it was a huge just mining bust that occurred. Um, but they also, uh, like if you look at the county maps, you wonder if they forgot to show up to like the day that everybody was drawing new lines because Lake was ginormous and it totally got carved up and um, you're like, oh, <laughs> bummer. <laughs> well, my last question, since, since you kind of lived in, in this data world and we're just seeing it <laughs> um, pretty quickly, are there, qualities that you see as being very healthy versus unhealthy um, community by community and do we have any of those in the extreme whether healthy or unhealthy that we need to be thinking about as we plan so that's actually that's a good question i um you know i pointed out a couple of things that i always look at i look at your age distribution i look at uh, how you migrate people in, like what age groups you attract folks. And I look at your industries uh, and the wages. Um, just because I want to see how all of those pieces balance together. And, you know, I pointed out a couple of things. One that it's, it seems like a, it seems like a nice situation to have a large share of your jobs in that mid-wage. Um, so I, I saw that as very positive, as well as your ability to attract kind of that 30-something. Um, 
areas that only attract 20 somethings sometimes it's a little bit harder because they'll leave uh, over time, you know, especially like right after they come, they tend to leave. Like if you looked at summits, that's what they've got. Um, so I thought that that would, those were the kind of the things that are healthy. I mean, I think the thing that's really hard is um, the, your size, the, the uh, size of San Juan. Um, when you've got a smaller base, um, it's a little bit harder uh, with some just uh, base resources that are available. And I think that would be the only thing that I was, that would, would come to my mind. Um, and probably the amount of jobs in tourism is something to just keep your eye on. I mean, I'm sure you guys realize it. Um, some places aren't always as aware of the dependence. So that's why I like to use that um, uh, base industry, you know, showing that about 56% of your base, your economic base comes from tourism. And just be ready for it, know what you'll do with it. And apparent, apparently you did fairly well with this uh, COVID year. Um, so that's about it. Awesome, thank you. Very good. Nancy, is there anything that you wanted to add? at all? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I had helped put together some of the slides, that's all. I'm mostly watching Elizabeth to get tips for giving my own presentations. But um, yeah, I everything was covered and um, don't really have anything to add. All right. She, you know, um, Mary, you had asked the other day if there was a pattern on movement. Like, do you see movement like from the front range to like a summit or an eagle and then from, a, you know, a smaller county then to an even smaller county? Um, and we didn't necessarily see a, a ton of pattern out there, um, but we'll, we're gonna keep playing with it again. What, was difficult is it it looked like um, well one you were losing out you were having some out migration so then trying to come up with a good pattern uh, made it hard we definitely see a movement from west slope or from uh, front range to west slope there's definitely a pattern in that direction and then other west slope counties gain and lose from other west slope counties so there's definitely that pattern. So it's like if they move from the front range to the west slope, then they're more likely to move within the west slope. I do have a curiosity question. Uh, the census data that I was looking at today did show that there was um, several people from the Virginia Beach and Norfolk, Virginia area that it moved to Silverson, some, or San Juan County in the early part of the decade. And I thought, well, that's a very interesting. Someone coming from the East Coast on the water, moving up to Silverton. And do you know anybody in town who's from Virginia Beach? <laughs> Just to see if the census data is actually accurate. But more of a curiosity, not necessarily a serious question. Yeah, that's probably referring to one of my old uh, co-workers at Silverton Mountain who moved here really? from Virginia Beach. Yeah, to that job. Wow. Yeah. All right. When, hey. when we saw the Larimer County information, I was like, oh, I know at least two of those people. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, good. Hey, that's great to know that there is some accuracy in the census data. Um, yeah, there was one county in the middle of Illinois that sent a couple people earlier, a couple of, maybe 10 years ago. It's like, well, that's interesting. And Wichita, Kansas. Anybody know anybody from Wichita, Kansas living in Silverton? <laughs> but just some of the interesting things we saw in that migration data. That's all. Well, back in the 90s, after the mine had completely shut down and a lot of folks in town that were leaving the mining industry, 
they were um, they were basically dumping houses just to get out because they had a new job someplace else. And we did have a mass population increase um, in the worst economic you know county in the entire state of Colorado at that time in the 90s. And we had people moving in from all over the planet, um, coming in, staying short term, um, some stayed long term, um, and eventually, you know, set down roots. But there was a huge influx um, before 2000 that was so diverse, it was kind of crazy. And then that kind of stopped. And then you had people who wanted to actually start living here full time again. And the advent of Silverton Mountain and them opening really changed the demographics again, because we got more of a um, transient work community that would come in six months a year. Um, and then we've seen that uh, be the latest trend for at least the last, what, 15 years or more, so. So in some ways, the town has experienced different waves of migration that do have different uh, characteristics to them, different demographics. That's interesting. Because we were wondering, do other Coloradans mostly move into San Juan? Or yeah, do you draw people from completely distinctive areas of the United States to a very distinctive place like San Juan? Well, this is really wonderful. Um, thank you. If there's more questions, you know, certainly we could keep it going, but uh, it seemed to be a lull, at least momentarily. Um, we have our next meeting on a week from today at six o'clock, the 29th, which is going to be the Comp Plan 101 with Casey and Andy. So excited to, to see that one too. And um, if there's anything else, uh, go ahead. Yeah, Sue. Um, I'd like to offer up, I've been researching other communities comp plans. And the, the one that really sticks out to me is Ridgeways. They completed it in 2019. And, you know, I know Ridgeway is a rural community as opposed to a mountain community, but they really seem to nail the um, the importance of characteristics of the community and keeping those vibrant and incorporated into their plans. So I love their approach. And if any of you get a chance or are curious, I'd encourage you to take a look at it also. There's a lot we could use in terms of community identity that just rolls through every aspect. Sue, so if you can hear us, you froze for a moment at the end, but I think oh, we got I'm sorry. most of it. <laughs> well, I'm encouraging everyone to look up Ridgeway's master plan and, um, and really relish and see how they use their community characteristics as a vital central theme throughout all of their guidelines. Great. Well, um, if there's nothing else, Elizabeth and Nancy, thank you very, very much for putting this together and sharing this with us. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we will have some more reasons to connect as we get further along in our planning processes. And well, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions, but uh, thank you so much for being a resource. Absolutely. Thank you guys. And it's nice to meet all of you. And again, please reach out if there's any questions as you guys are going through this process. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a great night. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Lisa, I just stopped recording on mine. Um, I am about to end the meeting and that will stop recording on my end too.
Cool. Right. I don't know where it's saved to, but if you need it, let me know and I'll share it. Okay. It should just pop up once, if you saved it to your computer, it'll pop up once it's done downloading and yeah, or just search Zoom and it'll pull up all the files. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Good night. Have a good night.